do, 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 Boom. Yes, it is Sunday again. Yes, it comes around far too quickly. Um, and I have to think about things to say far too quickly. But, you know, where we are, we are. Unfortunately, I've been away for most of this week, so um, I haven't really done much. So I, I was sort of, and I, I sort of came up with the concept of this, of today's rant on Monday, I think it was, and then sort of been doing some bit of, bit of research on it just to confirm my facts. But we are where we are, and we're now on Sunday, and here we are. Anyway, before we get on with that, oh, hang on, I just dropped it on the floor. Oh, that was really useful, wasn't it? Well done, John. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I thought this was mildly amusing. I've been away on business of week, and my hire car threw that symbol onto the screen while I was driving it. In fact, actually, I wasn't driving it at the time. I was sitting in the car park. But um, for those of you who are saying, don't use your mobile phone while driving. Yes, I wasn't using my mobile phone while driving. I was sitting in the car park. As you can see, I was doing zero miles an hour at the time. Um, but I think there is a bit of a faux pas by Ford in where they have um, placed their ice symbol. Uh, it looks like the car is farting or letting smelly gas out. Yeah, bit of a faux pas. Anyway, I thought it was mildly amusing. I thought I'd share it with you guys. Um, like it, don't like it. Hey. Um, the other thing that arrived this week while I was away and wasn't able to get um, was some shelving. So I went and picked that up yesterday morning from the uh, delivery company, which happens to be, as most delivery companies are, miles away from where you live. In fact, actually, that's not strictly true. All the delivery companies, bar two, are actually within a five mile radius of pretty much where I live. And these two, which seem to be the ones that are favored by a lot of, of carriers, are the ones that are miles away. Yes, brilliant. Anyway, so I went over there yesterday morning and I picked up these. And you're gonna say, what's that? Well, that is a retractable shelf that goes into a rack mount unit. I go, I go like that. Okay. Why do I need a retractable shelf? Well, I've actually been after a couple of these to put in the studio for quite a while. Um, because quite often you have things that you want to have near to a piece of equipment that's in the rack that you don't necessarily want to have to keep unplugging or, or have to pack away. You just want to sort of put it below this in a shelf. Now I've got standard shelves in the in the in the rack in any way, but they don't come out. And it's sometimes what you want is you want the stuff to just be able to come out um, and be fixed. And where I my requirement for these came from is actually to do with the boutiques, like the D505 that's behind me. In that what I want to be able to do with those is actually have them sitting on the shelf in one of the racks, all wired up, all midded up and, and powered up, etc. So that when I want to use them. All I need to do is pull the shelf out, pull it up, and it's all ready to rock and roll. So that's the reason why I've been after some of these. Um, but they've been extremely difficult to get hold of at a reasonable cost. Now, I saw these last year while I was in Jamaica on the Studio Spares website, and I all tried to order them then, and they were out of stock. And they've pretty much been out of stock most of the year, if I'm honest. And I could have sourced them from another another source, but the, the shelving units that they were trying to sell or they wanted to sell were effectively over a hundred pounds for one of these, and I wasn't prepared to pay that much money. So these have just come back on the back into stock at Studio Spares. They are now 20 pounds a pop, uh, and to be honest, they are a bargain, so I bought them. Uh, they have lips on the edges there. You can see there's sort of lips to stop the, any piece of equipment you have there sliding off. Um, believe me, things sliding off the back is not a great idea because I, I can't get my fat little arms all the way through. Um, I have to go around the back of the unit and that means moving everything, which is heavy and time consuming and just a complete ball ache. So um, they work like that. And the other use I'm gonna use for it apart from the boutiques is for things where I've bought some equipment uh, in the last year 
that has things like remote control. So the S750, for argument's sake, has the RC100 remote control. Uh, and I don't want to have to keep detaching the remote control from the unit every time I finish with it. What I really want to be able to do is just pop it on the shelf and slide it back in. Um, and that's what this enables me to do. So there are the uses for that. So um, just a piece of studio uh, uh, design. Doesn't, doesn't help you create music, it just makes you more... Um, it, what it has focused my mind on in, in my studio, because my studio is, is quite small and compact, is actually making sure that everything is properly uh, put away, otherwise things get into a bit of a mess. Anyway, the reason we are here is to actually talk about this thing. What is this thing you say? Well, this is an EMU Systems SP1200. Um, I'll put it up again. And why are we talking about this today? Well, that will become clear in a minute, and there is a bit of a clue behind me about um, why uh, we're going to talk about this. So. The SP1200 was, was retailed and marketed as a sampling drum machine. So in essence, what you would do is you would sample um, uh, a drum kit uh, and you would allocate each sample effectively to one channel. There was multiple channels, there were eight, there were eight outputs on this thing. So you'd allocate the, the, the drums to one of those channels and effectively you could have eight samples being triggered uh, and it also had a, a 5,000 note step sequencer on it, which will quantitize to 1 16th of a bar. So it was quite versatile from that perspective. Um, it was released in, in August 1987. So it was released right at the point in time where dance music was starting to come in. It was aimed at the same market that the Roland um, 808 was aimed at although I think the 808 was slightly before that. My memory is, is not brilliant enough. But that's, that's the sort of market. It was aimed at that dance market. And to be honest, I've only ever seen one of these things, okay, in the flesh. I've not really played with it. I've seen one of these. And that was um, a friend of a friend who was into hip-hop and dance uh, and was making music like that way. And I saw this thing on stage with him quite a few years ago we've got to be going back 10 plus years now okay so i've only ever seen it once I've never played with it but the sound was actually pretty damn good if i'm honest for what he was doing with it it was released in 87 it was re-released at periodic points over the next 11 years and the final release of this thing was 1998 and the only reason emu systems stopped releasing this thing wasn't because there was no demand, because these things were just flying off the shelves every time they did a release. The reason why they stopped doing it is because they ran out of the SSM chips that run the beauty. Okay, so they couldn't source any more of these chips. So here we have a piece of kit that has an audience, has a, has a market, and you can't actually sell any more because you've actually run out of the key components for it. But it was 11 years is a good run. If you think about electronics and electronic keyboards, you know, quite often we manufacture three to four years and that's sort of kind of pushing it. Um, you know, technology moves on, chips move on, design moves on, sound design moves on. Um, the power available to the designers move, it, it increases. So 11 years was a good old run for this thing, considering it didn't really change much in those, in those 11 years, there were a couple of sort of minor tweaks to it, but by and large, it was the same machine they released in 1987 was the machine they finished releasing in 1998. Why did people like it? Why did the dance scene and the hip hop scene like this thing? Well, you know, they, they refer to things like gritty sound, um, which was sort of due to the fact it sampled at 26 kilohertz. Um, and it was sort of only a 12-bit sampler. And I know this, because I mean, I've got the S50, and that gives you a really interesting sound be, being uh, sampled at a lower bit rate. So the modern samplers will sample at a much higher bit rate, and they will sample at CD quality or above. Um, these things, you know, memory was expensive back then. Uh, and in actual fact, this thing could only actually store 10 seconds 
of sample and it could only actually play a maximum of two and a half seconds of sample per channel. So you've got eight channels, maximum of 10 seconds across the, all those eight channels with two and a half on one single channel was the maximum. That's all it could do. All right, nowadays you can have these things with massive amounts of time against a sample or a loop, but back then you couldn't. That's, that's really what it was all about. The step sequencer on it was 5,000 notes, which is quite good, split across the, um, the eight channels, so effectively the eight channel sequence, it was an eight channel sequencer. Um, now, the interesting thing about this one was it replaced the previous unit, which was called the SP-12. And the SP-12 effectively was a, had all the sounds in a ROM chip. So if you wanted to change the sounds, you pretty much had to change the ROM chip. This thing didn't have a ROM chip. You switched the unit on and it was dumb. It had no sounds in it. You got a three and a half inch floppy. You loaded the sounds in from floppy drive. So it's pretty much the same sort of idea that came on with the, all the keyboards and, and stuff that was being produced about that time. They went away from having um, sounds or, or, or um, patches loaded into memory uh, to the point where every time you booted it up, effectively you were refreshing the memory. So if you if you had a power cut while you were using this thing and you just spent the last two hours sampling the drum kit and hadn't saved that back to disk, you know what? You say sayonara to the to the work. But that's what that's how this thing worked. Um, and I said a little bit before it had uh, a master mono mix out. And then it had eight individual channels which you could send off to your desk and then you could effectively have those channels being um, individually mastered on the desk so you didn't have to master them on the unit itself and again that was a really nice feature if you were talking about you know being able to sort of like put, put a, a snare or an electro tom or something over and above something in the mix really really nice so why was this thing so popular well Honestly, the reason why this thing was so popular was because it wasn't expensive. So at the time, if you were looking for a device like this, um, you know, you could quite easily spend five thousand dollars on it. You know, and and probably some of the sort of top names in the industry were spending that sort of money to get these devices. Whereas this thing came along, and it came along around about, I believe, about two thousand dollars. Massive price point uh, differential between. Um, the other the competition it also had a lot of features that some of the other comp pieces of competition didn't have like for example the original 808 didn't have midi this had a this had a midi a midi connection this thing had um you know you could sync it to a midi clock or you could sync it to an smtpe time code it was it was all there it was all standard on the on the unit um whereas a lot of the other units didn't have it so it became it started to become uh, give these uh, music producers and music production houses flexibility and that's the reason why they, they sort of got into this unit um, as I say it is just better facility so anyway if you were going to go and buy one of these what do you think it would cost well I can tell you now that I have not seen one of these things and I'd sort of just you know keep my eye on the on the market but I haven't seen one of these things come up for quite a while under four grand that's 4,000 US rather than 4,000 pounds, but under 4,000 US. I haven't seen one of these things um, go out on the market. In fact, I haven't seen one on a UK page um, for many years, actually. So I've seen uh, the odd one fly through on, on US pages, but not nothing really in the UK area. Um, but if you are going to go and buy yourself an SP1200, go for a later model. Okay, don't go for one of the earlier models, go for one of the re-releases, uh, mid-90s towards the sort of when the cut-off date of 1998. And the reason for that is the early models had a habit of over of overheating. Um, so go for a later model, they solved those cooling problems. As I said, they tweaked them slightly as they went through. And the later models are definitely a better bet than the earlier models. So I said, why was I going to talk about this thing? Well, the reason I'm going to go and talk about this thing is because on the internet a few weeks ago, right, images started to appear. Okay, and then you got the, and it's named an SP2400. Now, EMU have quite a few times 
made noises about re-releasing or releasing an upgraded version of that. And their um, terminology was the SP1600 and the SP2400. Um, so when this thing started to appear a few, year, a few weeks back, people started to get very excited um, whether this was actually going to be. And it, didn't, it wasn't originally branded, okay? So the, the pictures were coming out with no branding on them. Um, apart from the SP2400. Um, and, you know, people started wondering who was going to release this. It was an EMU, Behringer. Um, but, in actual fact, it turns out that the people who are actually going to be releasing or are in the process of doing a project with this are, in actual fact, the people who bought us this. This is my trusty cord bot. There you go from Isla Instruments, okay? So um, they released some pictures of it. Um, I think almost jokingly, they released pictures of this thing uh, a few weeks back to just sort of uh, tease the market and the response has been quite, quite mad. So anyway, I saw a, uh, a podcast, if you like, or a, a video cast uh, with Brad from Isla Instruments actually coming clean and saying yes this is us this is a, a project that we are doing um and in fact actual fact they actually posted a 3d cad design of um the internal circuit board layout and saying that they were expecting boards to appear at either instruments for the the initial builds quite soon now, Brad being Brad has been quite um, uh, cautious, shall we say, on what he is telling us. I mean, people are trying to draw him out and he's not, he's not taking the bait, so good on you, mate. Um, but he has said that the SP400 is an Isla Instruments project. It is something they are actively working on. Um, it is not necessarily going to be a straight upgrade to the, the the 1200 but they are looking for against the 1200 for the inspiration for the newer version of this thing he wouldn't be drawn on details of what they he what features and functions they were going to put into here one of the things he did say though that he doesn't think it's going to be a color display um he thinks it's probably going to be more of a monochrome display because it doesn't need a color display um he said that when they were working on this thing and they put the colour display in into the, the cord bot, what he didn't realise at the time was how um, much it, that, that colour display, how difficult it was to actually integrate it into the unit itself and, and make sure the colour was being correctly controlled. So, but for this unit, he said he thinks it's going to be a monochrome display. You know, hey ho, does it need a colour display? If it doesn't need a colour display, why put one on there? It's just added overhead into the, in terms of cost. Um, he also said that um, he expects the final machine to be built like a tank, bulletproof, and able to take field, puni field punishment. So he's looking for this thing to be out in the community. So uh, like like a lot of the uh, the tools at the moment, like the, the Roland um, TR8 series and the boutiques. Well, I'm not so, so sure about the boutiques going in, but the TR8 series is definitely designed to be used by the DJs in the DJ booths. Uh, and take punishment, although I have to be honest to say, I mean, a TR, a TR08 or a TR8 in a DJ booth with a pint of beer in it probably wouldn't work very well. Um, <clears throat> but he's saying, you know, he expects this thing to be built like a tank. He's looking for some sort of uh, so mold, um, aluminium chassis, I think, with screen print on top rather than go for a plastic chassis. Um, but we'll, we'll yet to be fine because he's so you know again he's being very very cautious on what he he actually says this thing's going to do because I don't think he's quite worked out what the full specs of it are at the moment. And the other thing he said is this thing will have a cost point of about a thousand dollars, maybe less. But again, he was 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 not going to be drawn on exactly that. Will come with USB. It will come with MIDI, and that's about it. So there you go. There's another drum machine option. Something that's based on the legendary um, EMU-12. Will it allow you to lo load the samples in from the original? Don't know. It hasn't been confirmed. Um, will you be able to... How will you sample? Don't know. Well, you're still to be confirmed. So there's lots of things about this yet to be confirmed. But this looks like a good watch this space 
because it looks like somebody has now again looked. I mean, you know, Isla Instruments have a number of projects. He's openly admitted that, but he's not really saying what those projects are. But that one's leaked out. That is active. That will he thinks that will be in the market space um, some point later this year. Would I buy it? I'm a sucker for this sort of stuff. Anyway, that's this week's rant over and done with. If you've got anything you want to say, put it in the comments below. Other than that, you know what? It's time to say live long and prosper. See you next week. So this is the point in the video where I turn around to you, my viewer, and say if you enjoyed the content of this video, please give it a thumbs up. The way the Google and YouTube analytic engines work is that the more likes you get against the video, the more it gets promoted by YouTube and Google, and therefore more people with the similar interest to what you have and I have get to see this content. This channel is driven by my love of music technology. That's what it's called the Music Tech Guy for. If you've got queries, want to ask questions about themes or issues I raise on this channel, please, please, please do. Put your comments into the uh, comment section below the video and I will try to address whatever issue it is you've raised or whatever question you've raised. If it's something to do with me making future videos in terms of uh, how to do something on a particular piece of equipment I possess, please feel free to say that as well. I can't promise to make videos on all the requests I get, but I do have a jolly good go at making most of them. Around about here is the subscribe button. Again, to do with the uh, YouTube and Google analytic process, the more subscribers the channel gets, the more the channel gets promoted, and the more people get to see the content that you have obviously just watched. If you want to see my latest video, it will be in one of these two boxes on this side of the screen. Also, there is a second box there, and that video will be chosen for you by YouTube based on your YouTube preferences. I look forward to the next time that we interact and I do mean interact because I always enjoy reading your comments back to me. But for now, bye-bye.